Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are when you're listening to or watching this particular webinar, Slant Bar podcast. My name is Mark Dupont. I'm the Executive Director for the National Maritime Law Enforcement Academy. And today we have a pretty interesting conversation. I think with technology going on all around us and things like chatbots and artificial intelligence, I think this subject is extremely appropriate, especially for those of us in the maritime emergency response public safety community. And so what we're going to talk about is AI on boats. And who we're going to talk to is someone that we've developed a great relationship with, someone that has taken on the steps to become a star product with the National Maritime Law Enforcement Academy. And if you want to know more about that, you can just click the link uh, on the screen, type that in, and I'll take you to that particular page and you can learn all about it. But I, I want to get deeper into this. I want to have a discussion about AI and its application on boats. And to do that, the person that I think knows the best of anyone on the planet, and I say planet because it's relevant, because I'm talking to him as he sits in Iceland, Carl. Let me introduce you to Carl, the CEO of Heffering Marine. And Carl, welcome, and thank you for taking some time today just to have a conversation about this and share it with our audience. Um, first and foremost, just, just tell us who Carl is, aside from the fact that you're in Iceland right now, I've already let that cat out of the bag, but go ahead. Tell us about Carl. Uh, firstly, thanks very much. And thanks for having me on. So yeah, Carl is, uh, <clears throat> well, currently, uh, CEO and, and, uh, one of the co-founders of Heffering Marine, uh, company that we established here in Iceland, as you, as you mentioned, um, back in 2018, but. Before that, actually, I was uh, I was involved in. Well, I've always been involved in analytics in some sense. Uh, firstly, in business and, and and finance, starting in starting my career in actually in medical devices, very outside of this industry and this space that we're talking about here. Uh, but what we were doing there was analyzing companies and and uh, and for the purpose of mergers and acquisitions. And it was always interesting to hear the other side or the perspective from the other side of the table somebody building something new mm -hmm. um, and, and to be fair that was always a bit more of an interesting perspective than the one I could bring to the table sitting from uh, sort of the corporate side um, after after that after I built up a pretty good background in that and, and become quite savvy in 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 the field of of sort of data analytics uh, for for finance uh, I wanted to explore something new. And there was a company here in Iceland uh, that was building a very unique type of uh, high-speed vessel, uh, mostly ribs, but, but uh, a scalable platform could be, could be expanded into a larger type of ship. But the main thing was uh, a unique hull and keel uh, shape. The company is called uh, Rafnar. Some people may have heard of it. But back then it was it was uh, I mean it was very new it was it was uh, very much a, a concept um, and it had been engineering driven for most of the time and uh, there was an opportunity there to to push that uh, push that innovation out and one of the main things that was sort of needed now that the product had been proven and and we um, or the team had had built something really unique and something great was to show it to the world. And because it was something that was signed, well, it was, a, it was a, it could be scientifically proven to be superior in some sense to, to other vessels, particularly in terms of mitigating impacts that you experience when going through different sea states. Um, that was something that we felt we needed. We needed data to show that. So that was one of the things that I decided to uh, get involved in. As well as helping them build up their uh, their sort of business development side and and uh, and and uh, strategy going forward, but this that particular project is sort of what ended up uh, becoming Heffring Marine, where we were studying these impacts on these these motions on these craft uh, and realizing how significant they could be, uh, and especially so in the comparison boats that we were looking at. 
so this, well, for me, it was a deep dive into the industry coming from well, being somebody who had not had a background in the industry, going straight into looking at the data, realizing there's something there and let's make use of it. And I think for myself, I've always, I've always been interested in exploring new concepts where they aren't available and seeing how they can be applied um, and how people can make use of them. And here was an opportunity. People weren't, the data that was there, which was, well, exists in large quantities in boats, just wasn't being used really, and, and particularly not in real time when, when the boat is being operated when it's most needed. So that so, was uh, that was the that was sort of the start. Of, that's that's uh, the start. The adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, data is a key word that you used, and we'll talk more about that when we kind of get into the software. Well, let's let's talk a little bit more about the software then, I guess. Um, so you create Hefring Marine, and what is it? What what is it that you're creating, and what are you putting in the hands of the operators and their managers and supervisors? How are you so, using that data? So if I if I just continue from where we were back then, um, so then we were collecting primarily information on on wave impacts or, or G-force impacts experienced on the vessels. Uh, the, the vessels that we had and then the comparison vessels that we ran alongside them uh, and their speed, just seeing the correlation between those two. Um, and realizing that each of these vessels had some differences in configuration. Some of them you would have the console in a, a center console position. Helmsman would be essentially the front most uh, crew member uh, would be feeling the worst of the impacts because as the boat goes through the water and has these um, uh, these motions happen, the frontmost area, the frontmost seating position is the worst affected. Uh, but then you had other types of vessels, the vessels where the, the, the console was way back in the stern and, and people would be sitting all the way up to the bow. And so then the, the operator was very disconnected from the worst impacts. And those were probably the biggest eye opener for us, those types of boats, because we realized there is definitely an opportunity just to tell the operator what's happening up there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that usually hadn't had much experience in, usually spending their time back in, uh, back in around the stern. Mm -hmm. So that's what it started as, monitoring those motions and those impacts um, and displaying them in real time to the operator in on a very simple display. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, changed colors, green, yellow, red, and then showed a line chart, the trend that was happening. Mm -hmm. And a uh, 3D printed box with a simple Raspberry, Raspberry Pi type of computer uh, and a cheap little sensor that we could get as a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. And people found it interesting. People said, well, those who we, who we tested with particularly here in Iceland said, yeah, this is something that, that could be useful. Like uh, I haven't really, hadn't really visualized this in this sense before. And, and then, then it, it had to take another step from there because we, well, one drawback with this is that we're just showing you what has already happened. So yeah, it gives you an idea of what is happening out there, but what do you do about it? And what is going to happen? So the, the uh, working with that data became a bit more uh, complex. We had to, had to derive some meaning out of it into the future. And what, what it, based on what is happening now, what has happened, what can we expect to happen? So that became the next step. And then to show the operator, what do we expect to happen? Um, and in that, uh, in that, uh, uh, so uh, thought process, we had to also think, which was equally important, how best to present it so that you can make use of it in real time. I mean, you, if you're operating a boat, you're already busy. You're keeping your eye on, uh, eye on the horizon and, and uh, trying to be situationally aware. So we don't want to pull your eyes down to a screen and have you staring at a screen the whole time. It needs to be something quick, easy, glance at it for a second and you get what the output means. Despite however complex the calculations are and all the data that's being crunched behind it, ideally one number 
look at it for one second and you know what to do about it. And that the most logical thing to do there was just to convert all of the output into speed. So this is your best speed right now based on how we have determined your very near future to look like. And that became the that became the concept. So you have your actual speed, you have your recommended speed or your, your uh, calculated speed, and those two should match. And you should be able to glance at that very quickly and be able to match those two speeds. And that became the basis for, for what we then built from there, um, being a, sort of an AI-driven tool on board that is making real-time use of the data that sits on board the vessel, which and largely, aside from the motion data and the impact data, which we, with the system, we provide the sensor for that because usually those sensors aren't in place, but a lot of the other data is in place. We, 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 know, we, can, we know your speed, we know your location, we can pull data from your engine. All of it is already there. It's a matter of how do you want to use it now and how do you then want to save it so that you can make use of it afterwards. So let's talk a little bit. You, you mentioned something towards the end there and, and I think it's really relevant to this discussion because it's one thing to capture data and tell everybody what happened it's another to capture data that says hey this is what might happen this is this is a recommended course of action and mitigating the potential impacts on the individual and on the platform itself uh, for the life cycle of the platform and obviously the life and health of the person driving it or the people on board so how does that work? What, what, what happens there? What type of data is it looking at to now very quickly make some recommendations on whether it be course, whether it be speed over ground, what, what, what's going on there? So one thing is, and it's like at your point, there is a, it's important to know what data you want to look at. And it's also important to not overload yourself with data. And we've seen that. Uh, we've seen that with uh, a number of companies, organizations who are interested in data. And the first step is usually to just collect as much data as possible before deciding what to do with it. Uh, which in some cases, if, if, you, if there's a solid plan in place can, can be fine. But in our experience, at least, defining what you want to do first. Like this is our use case, so therefore we need this data. Fine, if that means we collect a, a bit of extra data around it, that's okay, we can keep that, but we have a use case for the data that we need. And for this purpose, we need, we need to know how the vessel has moved through the water. And, and we need to know what the conditions were that the vessel moved or that the vessel has been, been operated in. Um, and we need to know at what speed it has been operated in. Uh, that gives a, these things alone give you a pretty good idea of, of uh, sort of the decisions that the operator made, uh, whether the right decisions, uh, were they decisions that are suitable to take given the, given the conditions, uh, and even just knowing what the motions of the craft were, you get an idea of what the conditions were. You don't necessarily need, you don't necessarily need to collect a vast amount of weather information. You, you, you have that data there being fed directly to you from response from the boat. Um, and also then in that process to know what do we expect to come out of this? You have, you wanna build some model, you wanna build something that generates some output for you that hopefully will help you make a decision. It is good to have an idea of what you expect to come out of it. Uh, not just throw stuff into a black box and then hope that something good comes out. Like if, if you can see the logic, the logic thread from, from A to B to C, then, uh, then chances are you can, you can have a model generate that for you too. And it will be able to do that quicker, obviously, because it can crunch a lot more information and a lot more data than you can in real time uh, and sort of augment what you're already doing. You're already paying attention to like I said before, the horizon, the environment around you, you can also be focusing on everything else. And this is an extra bit of information, which you know, if you have a lot of experience, a lot of it might come to you 
um, you know, as a feeling, you, you get a gut feeling that I see that wave coming. I kind of know how to, how to react to that. I'm not going to go full speed through it. And I, I know how to sort of navigate my way through it smoothly. But not everybody has that. And, and having the decision support to help you make that decision, how to navigate through that is what the system does. So being that augmented uh, or captain's augmentation, essentially, an, an assistant captain. Um, and from that, we have to know, like we, we had a pretty good idea. If we, if we know what the sea state has been or the sea conditions have been, on this trip and and uh, and can compare it with something with previous trips and and also with the speed you've done, we can figure out how to make the right decision based on what is expected to come, using speed uh, speed as an input into that, and then getting that 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 uh, recommended speed as an output. So you summarize, knowing what you want out of it is is pretty important. Yeah, and I think that you you touched on another key point there that, it, in my opinion, I think it's a big part of why this type of tool becomes valuable as we look at the maritime public safety community. One of the things that every industry is facing is very dynamic workforce, meaning uh, there's a lot of things going on. We've written white papers about it. Uh, we look at rapid retirement, we look at struggles in retention, we look at struggles in recruitment. All these things are affecting these organizations. And so what they're finding is they have people with less and less experience being responsible for performing these missions. And supervisors, managers are struggling with how, how do I do this effectively? How do I manage the people? How do I stay in tune with what they're actually doing out there on the water? And this provides a resource not only to give guidance to the operator that's less experienced, that says, hey, given these parameters, given what's going on with the weather, given where you're headed with this particular course, this is the recommended speed over ground. So that gives them some guidance. But from a performance standpoint, if I had Carl out there operating a boat who is very experienced, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I can set a higher threshold, if you will, as a manager and say, hey, Carl's pretty good at this. He's been running this boat for 20 years. I'm going to set some thresholds a little higher for him. But Mark, who's new to the department, who doesn't have that depth of experience, who has only six months on the job, I'm going to lower that a little bit and allow the system to alert me when Mark is exceeding the, that recommended guidance. So that's a that's an, a very important management tool that helps uh, supervisors stay in contact, but not literally directly be sitting next to the operators when they're operating the boat, but just be able to look at their fleet and know who's performing and who's maybe overperforming or underperforming. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Yeah, that's very accurate. And, and, and it sets it sets a a standardized baseline. So as a as a uh, a fleet manager or, or, or operator, you can set what those thresholds are. And, and like you said, you can set them, you can vary them across uh, vessels and, 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 and captains, depending on their experience level and, and knowing that also the the uh, system that is out there that is that is constantly calculating what is the the best decision to make at any given point in time as this or that vessel are being operated runs on the same logic across all of them uh, that logic obviously is is uh configured for a certain a, one vessel might be long longer larger heavier than another vessel so it's configured to each and every vessel but the, the it, base the base is the same it's still the same logic that runs through it. And you can have an impact on where you want that logic to stop or where you want that uh, uh, the threshold of that logic to be based on criteria that you said. I do not want us to cross uh, certain, well, stake impacts because we were talking about that earlier. I do not anybody want anybody to exceed these levels of impacts because 
well, I know it's it's harmful for my people, for my crew, for my passengers, mm-hmm. um, and therefore that becomes the underlying underlying rule across the entire fleet. Although this particular operator and that particular operator know they can handle themselves, they may also have to go out and do more difficult tasks. I can raise the profile a little bit for them. But I also don't want anybody to cross this speed limit. There's no need for us to go faster than this. And so that becomes applied across the entire fleet and is always there in front of the operator who is then informed about it. Mm -hmm. And all the data that then comes back is usable as training data. I mean, the system is usable on board as a training device too. And and we've seen that and we've, we've had those use cases where less experienced operators have used the system to guide them to use, you know, in operation on operations of boats that they haven't used before, mm-hmm. where the system even tries to push them up, you know, get above planing speed, you're going too slow right now. Um, whereas it will behave very differently with a skilled operator, more likely mimicking, mimicking uh, what the decisions of that operator are, because it's essentially what we want the system to be. We want it to be replicating the decisions of a skilled operator mm-hmm. and i mean i, I got that uh, feedback uh from uh someone the other day who who mentioned that they had they had uh, run the system uh, or they had, they had run their boat uh, in one direction without looking at the system and then run the boat back in the in the in the same path but in the other direction uh, but now using the system and essentially the same decisions were made back and forth. But that's an operator who who knows what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And he's very skilled. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can you can make that barrier, that skill barrier uh, shorter. So that learning curve a little bit quicker uh, by having a tool like this on board, which is largely based around the skills of those that came before, those that have used the system. And that's how you how do you retain skill when people leave? One way to do it is to capture data of those that were skillful and then trying to move it on into you know getting somebody else to make use of that data, mm-hmm. either as continuous guidance on board or as you know metrics. You have that report in front of you. This is how we usually do. You have all the data on how how uh, your best operators have have performed, and you can use that as a as a baseline. Like this is how we want to. This is how we want to perform. These are our these are our best crew, and everybody should strive to be more like them. So, with every profile being fairly standardized, and that's one thing that comes out of the system automatically is your profile as an operator. Try to match this profile the best you can. This this uh, sort of template for a good captain profile that we have here, and use the system on board to help you get there. And if I'm Correct. The system goes a step further with what you just described in that there's steps to earn or badges to earn or stripes to earn. You know, you can progress. And this is uh, as has been proven by users. They are motivated to get to the next level. It's almost a, a competitive environment there where, wait a minute, Carl has, you know, He's two steps above me. I, I need to perform appropriately to be equal to or surpass exactly. Carl in my operations. So there becomes a because I think I think that's an important statement to make, Carl, because a lot of the reaction that I've seen initially when we talk to people about this particular type of software is and this is this is prevalent across all of law enforcement not just the maritime world but wait a minute big brother's going to be looking at me and you know there's just another thing that's sitting over my shoulder watching what i do and and to some that's an immediate uh defensive reaction but when we talk through it and talk to people who are actually using it the benefits far outweigh any concern someone has about big brother watching over me. And I think that's an important part. Um, And on that point as well, just to jump in on that point as well, is that the, I mean, I spoke to a user the other day who, uh, who had been using the system for one day and was already using it to his benefit because it had already informed him of the thresholds that he did not want to exceed Mm -hmm. before, before uh, anybody, 
told him before he got any training or instruction, like first thing he said, oh, I already know that 3G is just my limit. Mm -hmm. So it is to the, and, and I mean, that was a skilled guy. I mean, he'd been doing this for seven years or so. Mm -hmm. so it, was, it, was, it wasn't his first day on the job, but he never had it. And he'd never had that information visualized like that in front of him and made meaningful mm -hmm. where he could just say, ah, that's that's my threshold. I just I, I value my back. I value my knees. I, I, I'm not going to ruin them on this trip or any trip. So mm -hmm. I've set myself a threshold and I'm fine with that threshold mm -hmm. because that's that's, you know, where I value my health. So what is more important going getting there really fast or, you know, being able to do this for a longer time and, and, and making sure your body stays in, in good shape. So it is to the benefit well that's i mean our original concept to the benefit of those that are operating the boat first and foremost yeah because uh you know you often quote a pretty significant statistic about the number of mishaps that occur due to human error and you know if you're looking at you know over 90 percent of those things that could have been avoided had the information been in front of those operators to probably prevent that from happening. This becomes an important reason to have the data in front of them, to have at least the warning signs, the alert signal that, hey, I might be pushing over that threshold, pushing the limits of both the platform and me, which leads me to, you know, looking at who the, the who who looks at this data with a degree of importance? Who is it important to? And I think we've already talked about the operator and your example of a individual who's been operating it just for a day. That, that's clear right there. We've talked a little bit about the manager. Okay, so I'm watching my people, but I'm also looking at my platforms. I'm, I'm, I'm extending the life of my platforms by saying, hey, these are the operational parameters that we're going to put in place. I'm looking at that data and see that boat X has been used, you know, 205 hours and boat Y has only been used 37 hours. And I can start looking at preventative maintenance and, and how I service those boats. I can also look at it and say, you know, what's, how is this affecting my fuel consumption? I, yeah. I go back to boat X, who's, you know, running at 6,000 RPM every time it leaves the dock and putting on those hours and it's consuming a tremendous amount of fuel is can I put some thresholds on there to slow that down and it, again not only extend the life of the platform but save me in fuel cost and reduce that carbon footprint that you know obviously everybody is paying a little bit more attention to who else is there is there other people or other reasons why the data becomes important i mean one thing worth mentioning is I mean, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're low. Firstly, there's the, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, one is the operator on board. Mm -hmm. The guidance is for the operator on board. Then there's the, the manager on land, the fleet manager, or, or, or those who are handling maintenance or handling safety or, or, uh, or fuel consumption that have the whole fleet wide overview and can fetch that data down to, you know, granularity, down to each and every individual trip, down to minute by minute per trip, if needed, but also just to get a clear idea of how, over this span of time, how did we do uh, with regards to safety, with regards to fuel consumption, uh, maintenance needs on the boat, the system will fetch any maintenance messages coming out of your vessel and feed that directly back to whomever needs to see it. Uh, whether that be for, for preventative maintenance or for engine monitoring, for example. So it is a, it is a one-stop shop tool at this point. I mean, it started as this safety system, but because we had access to this data on board, we started building features around it. We had the, this data there. And then once it was there, people that we we're working with realized it was there. We got asked, could you make us a feature that will also show us this? I would really like to see, uh, uh, you know, RPM step size, or I would like to see my engine data and RPM step sizes. Uh, so I don't have to go and fetch the data from uh, from the vessel itself and create that myself. Could I just get that automatically generated? So that's in there. Uh, I mean, any 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 uh, anybody who needs to be aware of what those vessels are doing out there, from 
any perspective, from any of those maintenance, safety, fuel, et cetera, they are all relevant stakeholders to the system. But there's another, I mean, there are outside stakeholders too. We, I just got back before, before calling into, uh, into this webinar. I just got back from a, a meeting with an insurance company here in Iceland and, and one of their customers who use our system. And uh, we were going over their, their last uh, years, they're, they're a tourism company, and we were going over their last summer, just quick one pager of a, of a report with the highlights of the data that came from that. And uh, to, to validate whether they would get a discount for that period, which they did. They ended up getting their discount uh, because they were able to demonstrate you know, how much depth of insight they have now into their fleet operations that nobody else, well, other than those that operate, have our system on board, have available. And the insurance company was very happy to see that. I mean, that is a risk mitigator from them, having all that information available and being able to trace that story. How did the summer go? How can you, can you talk me through um, why the data looks like this? How did you perform on average? Your safety quality score, which is something that the system produces. Uh, it looked very high. It looked good. It looked promising. So that was one of the one of the things that they were they were happy with. Um, and now with that company, then afterwards, uh, now they're also interested in looking into their their fuel consumption. And maybe I dropped that in here, but we once we created this model to optimize speed on board for safety, we realized very quickly that you know you are very likely to be saving fuel by following this, this speed. It isn't de developed for fuel safety as such, uh, fuel, fuel economy as such, but it is trying to make your ride smoother. It is trying to have you waste less energy on vertical motions and instead moving you forward in a smoother way and at a more reasonable speed based on the conditions you're in. So we took that, sort of branched that off, took that a step further and then created its own neural network around fuel consumption, pulling in fuel data and using the same concept of a model, predicting, uh, predicting optimum speeds based on expected, uh, uh, expected fuel consumption curve in different environments and different conditions. And that's something that that we've been running now on on uh, on sort of a uh, limited basis with with selected customers for now. But now are launching it this month. Um, so if anybody's interested in listening to this webinar, then then that's something that that we could uh, that we could uh, like run on a, on a pilot basis or or mm -hmm. provide you with. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is something that we've been able to see from the data is on average, producing, uh, you know, fuel consumption, um, lowering fuel consumption by on average 15 to 18%. And for, for just a case that we were looking at this morning with, uh, with the insurance company and this tourism company, just looking at a certain sea condition, look, seeing that they could be saving anywhere between uh, 14 and 17% or so in those sea conditions, which were largely prevalent where they operate. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a lot of savings potential there too, from that new, new uh, fuel optimizing, fuel speed optimizing model. And it will work in the same way. It will, it will provide you with the optimum speed to follow right now in order to achieve the highest speed you can without becoming inefficient. Mm -hmm. So it's not trying to get you to go as slow as possible. It's finding what is the highest speed you can do where you don't sacrifice too much time, but still save fuel. And then showing you what time are you going to be sacrificing as a percentage uh, and what can you expect to save so that you as an operator can make the right decision or management team can set a mandate if, if you can expect to save more than 8% in fuel consumption uh, or more than 10% or, or what have you on an average trip and you only expect to run 8% over the time of what it would normally be, then make that decision. And that could then be something that 
simply operators would follow if they if that criteria is met, which is easily visualized on the display. So you uh, mentioned a point about insurance companies, and I think you know what pops into my head when you mention that. I go back to my workforce dynamics issue that we talked about. And this not only affects people within the public sector, uh, the public safety sector, emergency response sector, but also in the recreational boating sector. We have, we saw this mass growth spurt within the recreational boating market and after effect of COVID. People yeah. were holed up in their houses and and couldn't go anywhere on vacation. So they took that money and they spent it on things like campers and RVs and boats. And we saw this explosive growth in the recreational boating market. So you have a lot of people that are now on the water with zero to very limited boating experience. And I would think from an insurance perspective, as they face more and more incidents that are occurring, and more and more claims that they would be extremely interested on data that could help that operator operate more safely. And again, preserve the life of the boat, but also the lives of the individuals that are on board. So I think that that's a, a huge opportunity. And I know you've been talking with some recreational boating companies, uh, and but that translates to my next thought where I went with that is, the boating manufacturers themselves. Nothing I think is more important to them than having data about their boats. They build the boat, they, they tell you that it can do this, this, and this, but where's the proof, right? They, mm -hmm. they might've tested it within their own confines, but where's the data that says, this is how your boat is performing in this type of environment. And, and when you look at your global applications, uh, you truly are a global company. We're talking specifically about its application in the United States, but but when you look at that and having that type of data and wa watching how boats from manufacturer A are operating in all different environments, I'm sure is something that they're interested in as well. Yeah, for sure. And we have some we have some uh, uh, great partnerships with 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 good boat builders who who see that opportunity uh, being able to. Being able to demonstrate uh, their performance of their vessels, and I think it's also a, a a mark of confidence if you're willing to show in the data or with data uh, how your vessel performs, and then you will you will to share that. There's also a, another benefit to boat builders is that they have then the data needed for you know warranty cases in particular. Which benefits actually both sides, buyer and and uh, buyer and builder. For builder, I mean, it is it it, it they have uh, terms that are set according to some standard, and then it's easier to verify if those are met or not. And the same for for the 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 buyer, the owner, easy to demonstrate this happened. Uh, it fits within the terms because the data shows it. And because the the readings impact readings are this, this was the sea state I was operating in. Uh, you can see exactly how I operated the boat, um, and this was clearly not a fault of mine. Falls within warranty, and and it just makes transactions like that easier mm -hmm. uh, and much clearer. Uh, but it it is a uh, it will be interesting to see as as we grow and as we as we uh, as we get more uh, more and more systems out there the growing variation between types of vessels and how they operate and being potentially be able to index them at some point, which, which is a, be an exciting step in the future. So that's a good segue point. You talk about the future a little bit. Let's talk about where we are right now. I, I'm real curious as to what your perception is because I have an opinion, but I'll save it uh, for a moment. The maritime industry as a whole, the the Let's talk specifically about the public sector. Where are they as it relates to technology? 
Uh, is there a lot of people out there, you know, open to this concept and looking for this? Or is it not so open, not so advanced? Again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm curious as to how you see the market right now as it sits. Are they, are they open and willing? Are they adopters or are they? Watching? I think from, from almost everybody that we've spoken to in the public sector, they are interested and people are want to be adopters. They want, they see, they want technology like technology like this. They need it. They're, they're usually, uh, they're wowed by the amount of data that and information that they can get and just opens up a new perspective that they didn't have before. Now, all of this thing, all of this information that sort of they've been missing or they've been wanting is right there in front of them. No work needed to be done on their front. It's just, there automatically produced for you as soon as every trip is, is completed or in front of you on board telling you exactly how how to uh how to do better or how to uh how to uh adapt according to conditions and so i i think i think from a people's perspective most people we've spoken to are adopters or the want to be i think in the public space it's just where it where it slows down is more uh, just bureaucracy, which is often just the case, and and mm -hmm. uh, and that may slow innovation down because things have to decisions have to go through a lot of different steps and a lot of different decision holders and, and uh, decision makers, uh, and and needs to fit into a a predefined budget or predefined decisions that have been made, and and perhaps technology like this fits into a scope for next year or or, or a future plan. So there's a, it is often out of the hands of the individuals who really want the system on board. Um, that's not to say that we don't have customers in, in the public sector who, who haven't gotten our system onto their boats. We, we have customers like that. But it is more difficult, and I think it's more of a challenge in the public space, uh, especially when, when there is a, an innovative concept that isn't, like we 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 believe we built something innovative and, and something particularly on the on the onboard sort of AI powered application uh, the guidance application we don't see that in in other systems uh, and being a small company uh, pushing that idea out there uh, is tricky in the public space because it's uh, if if it isn't, isn't recognized on an industry-wide level with a lot of competition, uh, then you you have to push a lot on your front. And even though you get all the operators and, and uh, the people in the field interested, it still needs to climb up the ladder. Um, but I think that's just the nature of those sort of organizations. They're just by necessity, I guess, structured in that way. Um, and you have to navigate those ladders. That's a really good point. And you, you, you mentioned something, by the way, you're making this conversation easy because you keep giving me these little nuggets that I can pick up and, and, and ask. Uh, you're creating this thought process in my mind. You talked That's about other systems. What yeah. other systems are out there like yours? Uh, there are systems out there that, that are data loggers. Uh, and often they are I mean, often they are specific to a certain type of data. You might have engine data uh, monitoring systems, um, or, or you may have you have impact monitoring systems out there. Um, what we want to do is what we where we see ourselves is we are a platform. We we have this one platform. You put this one box on your on your vessel, and all of those solutions become available to you. Um, and and. It is an evolving entity uh, or an evolving, uh, an evolving solution. We, we keep adding to it. Uh, we keep adding new features and when we keep working with our partners, knowing what they want and we can build it into our, into our solution so that the next time they turn it on, it is there in front of them. Uh, because if we have the data, we're collecting the data from the vessel and that's the goal. Collect everything from the vessel and then let's make something interesting out of it. Let's make something that is valuable uh, based on based on what our users want to see. Um, and so that's that's where I think we have 
that and uh, the, the guidance feature on board. And I'd say our, our sort of uh, visual design of our system. And, and I think we've done a good job in taking somewhat complex information and boiling it down into a very easy to grasp and easy to work with application, um, which, uh, which we put a lot of time into, into uh, developing and designing. Um, that's where we, I think, are, are unique and try setting it up as put this one system on your boat and have all of this information in one centralized, in one centralized platform. So there's two things you mentioned there that I think are important. You talked about the box going on the boat. How how big is this box? We're talking about, I'm sure some people are thinking about, oh my gosh, this must be a lot of stuff to connect to. And uh, what what are we looking at here? So not very big and uh, I'm converting in my head now. So uh, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm in, I'm working in centimeters. <laughs> uh, so if, if I, if I, if I, Say it in uh, in centimeters. It would be about uh, twenty centimeters or so uh, in length, and about the same in width, um, and then about ten centimeters high. So you have a box that's about difficult to to judge the perspective here, but but uh, smaller than my laptop that I'm working from here, and I have a small laptop. Yeah, um, would I be accurate in saying? Uh, they're all familiar with the VHF radios that they have on their boats. It's about the size of a VHF radio. Yeah, you could put it. Yeah, you could put it that way. Yeah, you know, and then you know. it is connected to a sensor. Mm -hmm. So depending on the size of the boat and sort of what information you want from the boat, uh, the arrangement of the one or more sensors will be different. But the main sort of standard system comes with that one sensor, and that sensor is there first and foremost for uh, monitoring of the crew space. Mm -hmm. um, and is placed in the frontmost seating position or below the frontmost seating position, which often turns out to be the, the helm's position. Um, and from that, we use, or the system uses the uh, motion data in order to calculate uh, its predictions and, and to, to show what the impact and expected impacts are. Uh, but you can also add separate sensors if you want to monitor impacts to the hull itself, for, for example, for warranty purposes. Or if you want to have uh, sensors dedicated to whole body vibration, so those continuous vibrations that you have on board from not just wave impacts, from just sitting on a boat constantly, just sitting on a piece of equipment that has a massive engine and is constantly vibrating. And that has an effect. I mean, that has an effect over the long term. If you have to be on that thing eight hours a day, every single day, those vibrations will, will have an effect on your body. And there is, there is a defined exposure limit, like what a person should be allowed to be exposed to in terms of vibrations over you know, a given workday. And that you can also get, uh, get from our systems where, system where the operator essentially sees in front of him something that looks like a, a fuel gauge. A fuel gauge is full at the start of the trip and over time, it, over the duration of the trip, it, it drops as, as crew is exposed to more vibrations. Um, and that can help to uh, uh, determine crew fatigue, like mm -hmm. proper crew fatigue levels and when, when people should be rested and rotated. Um, so back to the equipment itself, then you have this uh, the computer itself, the, the main box connected to one or more sensors. The computer is then also connected to uh, obviously to power, is to connect it to the, the sort of standard CAN protocol on board, the NMEA 2000 protocol, where we collect other data from. If in some vessels there are different uh, configurations, you may have another separate CAN bus for the engine. We tend to work with our customers to make sure that we, we uh, capture all the right data through the right means into our system. Um, and then you would uh, have, a, uh, have an antenna for the, for the uh, cellular modem. Uh, but if there is already a modem on the boat, we can also make use of that. We don't have to add another modem or another antenna. Uh, that's where we are quite flexible. We can work with what's already on board. Um, and then finally, we can hook up to your existing display. We don't need to add another display. If you have 
any of the main street or the sort of main uh, displays of Raymarine, Garmin, Simrad, Furuna, we can uh, simply connect our system to that device um, and display our interface there. Um, or well, if that you have, further simplifies the operator only having to look at one screen. They're not looking at their Simrad or Raymarine unit for navigational purposes and then at another screen to figure out. So I, I think that's a key feature. Yeah, we, we discovered that quite early on. Uh, I mean, it is still an option if some, some users want a separate screen so that it's just always there in front of you, and it can do that. I mean, it also has an HDMI output if you just want a HDMI screen in front of you. But, uh, but when we started with our prototype uh, back in the day, uh, we had a, a, an Android tablet. So we, we built, a, the system itself was essentially an Android app connected to a Bluetooth sensor. That was the prototype. And, but then you always had to have the Android tablet in front of you. And the reason we decided to use Android rather than iPad is just because iPads are a lot more expensive. We get cheaper <laughs> Android tablets, which was uh, essential for a, for a small startup company. Mm -hmm. uh, but that always meant you had to fix the tablet somewhere in front of you, meaning it was a separate screen. It was a new display. Uh, and we realized we, we didn't want to add that complexity. We, we are not going to compete in this place. That's not, that's not our, our game. There are already companies out there that make very good displays. Let's just use those. So I've got a good idea of what it, what the equipment is, um, how much does this cost? Just as an average, that's obviously something everybody wants to know. You know, they're I'm sure in their minds they're projecting some big numbers. How how much does this cost to put on my boat? So it would we we charge on the the hardware. So you buy the hardware, and then there's a subscription component to the 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 ongoing uh, uh, software. And, and, and service that that provides. So the hardware itself and, and that kit is just under, under $4,000 and converting from Euro right now. So it's about $3,800 or so. Um, and then the subscription um, is around 2000, uh, 2000, converting again in my head, 2,700 or so dollars, 2,800 on a yearly basis. Uh, and that's per vessel. Uh, but if you were to have a fleet of a number of vessels, so that would be for one system. But if you have a fleet of a number of vessels, then we would encourage you to reach out to us and we provide a we would provide a proposal for mm -hmm. your particular fleet based on your mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. I think the uh, key point here also where, at least in the United States here, we have the Port Security Grant Program going on right now. The government uh, has announced or released a notice of funding opportunity, otherwise known as a NOFO. Uh, they're continuing what they've done over the last number of years and making uh, about 100 million US dollars available to ports and port security organizations, including emergency responders. Uh, this is a time of year where a lot of people buy boats uh, to fulfill their mission responsibilities in port security, this is something that they can easily pencil in as a requirement. Uh, and I encourage them to do so, uh, especially when you look at how this can extend the life of that platform, reduce fuel consumption, reduce the carbon footprint. I mean, all the benefits from a government perspective in approving that grant are obviously pluses on the side of the organization that's uh, asking for that particular boat. Um, let me, before I ask you to kind of share with us what the software looks like, uh, this is being used all over the world. What are some of the organizations that are using this right now? And some big organizations, both from uh, you have big manufacturers, like you mentioned earlier, there's some manufacturers that are boat builders that are using this as part of what they're putting out there. And you also have some big uh, governmental organizations that are using this. Yeah, so we, we started, I mean, we started uh, in rescue. Um, and that's because 
well, it was a bit of a product of COVID because uh, we, you know, started selling our first version, which was essentially the prototype to the early adopter customers who wanted to try it out. Uh, just as, well, like 15 minutes to COVID, great timing. Uh, <laughs> and initially that prototype was quite suitable for, for tourism. I mean, we have a lot of tourism boats here and that's the pain point that we had been studying initially. Uh, but when, when COVID hit, obviously there was no more tourism, but then we turned our attention to those that still had to be out there. And that was search and rescue and, and, and Coast Guard uh, here in Iceland, at least. And, and from that, we, those connections and that sort of established, uh, established connections with other similar organizations elsewhere, particularly in the Nordics. Uh, moving to Norway with a Norwegian search and rescue, and and then uh, the Swedish Swedish uh, Sea Rescue Society, uh, down to the Netherlands to the the Dutch KNRM, uh, the uh, Lifeboat Institute. There, I've uh, been working with the the uh, uh, the RNLI in the UK, uh, and then even have uh, partnerships now down in in uh, in Australia with a boat builder there who, who's actively promoting our system uh, to, to government agencies there. A uh, large boat builder in, in Norway, uh, also have been working with Viking Norsafe. Uh, and things have been, have been rolling quite a lot for us lately over the last few months. Uh, this commercial version of the system that we have now, which took over from that original prototype. We effectively launched that in the beginning of 2022. Uh, and that has, well, gained a lot of attention, I can say. And, and uh, uh, customers now in, in the US as well with uh, law enforcement, uh, a companies like Towboat um, and, uh, and uh, partnership with, uh, with uh, or good collaboration with uh, with with Safeboat as well, uh, who have uh, who have been demonstrating our system now on on their uh, on their uh, uh, interceptor vessel. So it's 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 gotten around for sure, um, and and it's it seems like it's going to uh, it's going to grow quite a lot now in in the coming months, especially with the number of proposals we've been sending out. And I think it'll keep rolling because uh, that's the, my last question uh, as far as our discussion here. And then we'll uh, segue into a demonstration of the software. Where is this going? And I think you just, again, you're, you, it's as if we scripted this, Carl, and we certainly didn't. We're just having a conversation. But where is this going? What do you think the future holds? I, I think the future is getting ever more data driven. I mean, we, we see that in other industries, um, often compare the automobile industry to, to, uh, to that of boating, which is arguably a few years ahead uh, in, some, in some respects. And you have, you have uh, tools there on board already that have been around for ages, driver, driver assistant tools. And now with uh, new platforms with, with, uh, Sort of data monitoring acquisition tools for uh, for fleets of vessels as well. So this is becoming something that we're seeing in other industries, and and data is is also going to become increasingly more important in this new sort of sustainable future that we want to progress toward. Uh, we're going to have to rely on more automation in what we do i mean we can we can rule out we can rule out uh bad decisions or bad habits by having more processes automated um they're not necessarily just control units just just uh or just the entire control of the vessel itself but a lot more processes going going on behind the scenes can become autonomous in that sense even though the human operator still has a uh, sort of control of the wheel, um, but arguably going more and more in that direction and, and, and data will be a driver in that. And we are, we are a company that is, that is uh, 
geared up for that future learning learning what is uh what will be what will be needed how how do we uh how do we teach a system to operate like a skilled human operator and how can that help the modern or future fleet going forward in in this connected world that that we will be living in i think you're sitting at the right place carl i think that uh I, I concur. I agree with what you're saying. I think that we're really being able to, well, let me rephrase. I am able to sit here and watch, you know, the the fourth industrial revolution where we look at data being the center point of how so many things are being developed and implemented and incorporated into everything that we do. So I get to witness it. You get to be a part of it. You're actually uh, helping to create that. So I think it's just such an exciting time. I'm obviously pretty passionate about the maritime world, so I'm excited to see what it does for the maritime industry. I think, you know, back to an earlier question I had asked, I think that we tentatively tend to be a little bit slow to catch up with what might be going on around us for all the reasons that you talked about and others. It's just a, the maritime industry as a whole is just very kind of slow archaic in some regards but slow to move forward as you look at the application of technology in all aspects of the maritime transportation domain so but i think as you said everybody we've talked to about this type of tool has been extremely interested there's been no one that says no i don't think that's for us and uh, everybody is very interested in wanting to explore deeper so i think we're at the right point at the right time and i'm excited to, to work with you as we uh, push out this star product this gives us a good opportunity to segue into uh, an actual demonstration so let's do that now where we'll kind of take a break here and then turn it over to you and i'll give you the opportunity to just share with us how this actually operates people can actually see uh, the software at work here, what it looks like, what type of feedback they get as a manager or a supervisor, and we'll go from there. Sound like a plan? Sounds like a plan.